Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March 2023 meeting of the Montgomery County Civic Federation. Thank you all for joining for an exciting program this evening. Hope you'll all participate. We're going to take care of some Federation business uh, before we start with our program on affordable housing. And the first thing we will do is we will, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for uh, this March 13th meeting. Is there a motion, motion to, to adopt, adopt the agenda? Is there a second? Good. And first and second, those all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions, the, ad the agenda is adopted. It's on page two of our uh, newsletter. The next order of business is to approve the minutes from the February 13th, 2023 general meeting. Uh, it's on page 19 of the newsletter. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as printed in the newsletter? Motion to approve. It's been first. Is there a second? Peggy, are you going to? <laughs> yes, yes. It's, yes. Been, first, it's been first and seconded. Um, <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, the uh, minutes from the February 13th meeting are approved. Next order of business is the, oh, here comes Scott. Next um, order of business is the uh, treasurer's report. Jerry, can you give us a treasurer's report, please? Uh this is a Treasury's report as of March 13th. We're on a fiscal year that began January, July 1st, 2022. And 13th, we, we have revenues of $1,718, uh, $40 in the last month. And we have expenses of $1,228, giving us a net loss for, the, for these many months of $210. Our current bank balance is $8,494. Anyone has any questions, let me know. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jackie, can I make you a co-host as well? Sure, I might have to be up and down, but. I know, I just, I understand. Okay, everybody, this is the point in our meeting where we ask uh, anybody to share any announcements that they that they have for uh, the rest of the membership. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share with uh, with the audience? Well, let me just mention that, uh, as most of you know, or I'm sure some of you know, the uh, county has put out an announcement for applicants for the uh, planning board, planning board chair, and a planning board member. Uh, that announcement came out today. The deadline for, for applications is April 3rd at 5 p.m. Uh, it's continuing the progress of uh, repopulating the uh, planning board. Annual compensation for planning board members is currently $30,000, and the full time chair currently earns $228,000. So that'll be interesting. Pay attention to that process and you can find the information on the county's, uh, on the county's website. Ellen? Yeah. In the bad old days, we used to have a panel of two or three people interview the various people that were applying and were, we thought had a chance of getting in. Are we no longer doing that? Uh, we haven't, we didn't do it for the last group, that's for sure. Does and that mean uh, if we can, it? If, it? if we can do that, we will, uh, we will definitely try to do that. I know that other groups have, uh, other groups have done that. Um, but thank you for reminding us about that, uh, Peggy Dennis. Anybody else have any other announcements? Then let's proceed with our program. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our vice president, uh, uh, Elizabeth Joyce, who is going to moderate uh, both sessions of our meeting this evening. Um, Scott, I did see you here. 
Scott, where are you? Yep, I'm here. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, great. Um, so let me turn it over to Liz Joyce and thank you, Liz, for agreeing to moderate this program. Well, thank you, Ellen. And I am I am really extremely excited about this program this evening because we are at a tipping point in Montgomery County regarding housing policy. Um, we are in the throes of massive changes that will be uh, initiated by the recent passage of our 30 year general plan Thrive Montgomery 2050. Um, one particular philosophy, a new urbanist philosophy, and there's only one of many, which you wouldn't know to hear some of the um, narratives about this, has been narrowly interpreted by previous planning board and it forms the basis for the changes that will be taking place in our county. Um, subject matter experts on planning and the environment have not planning and the environment have not been able to influence this paradigm. So we're at a crossroads where the council will start passing measures to implement this plan, which has not been altered significantly for a number of years. Uh, so we're having this evening two experts, uh, Dr. Dr. Burden and, um, and Michael O'Grady, who is a quantitative analyst from uh, Arlington, and they have perspectives that should give us some insight about what we're trying to accomplish and what the pitfalls are. Because the big issue is that we need more housing, we need hundreds of thousands more units in Montgomery County, and yet most of the people who are expected to uh, be new residents here will be making less than $50,000, which means that they need deeply affordable housing. So I would like to start by introducing Dr. Bruton, who uh, is a, has been de Deputy Director of the Montgomery County Department of Housing and Community Affairs. He will give us some insights on his experiences about affordable housing, what the county needs to do and what it is doing, and what we might be able to do to influence policy at this point. Uh, Dr. Bruton, we're so happy to welcome you this evening and thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, how are you doing this evening? Okay, can everybody hear me okay? We hear you perfectly. Um, so, thank you, Scott. Um, sure, as I talked with, uh, with Alan about when he asked me here, uh, I don't have a formal proposal for you this evening. I came just to kind of to talk with y'all, to answer questions, to hear your perspectives, uh, what you're interested in seeing in Montgomery County, what you're concerned about, uh, what you're happy about. Um, so as I guess I'm now acting director while we're uh, searching for a new director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs, um, DHCA covers a, a, a wide variety of different responsibilities related to housing. Uh, one of the most obvious being uh, the creation and preservation of affordable housing, which is handled by our uh, housing unit. Um, we do that through a variety of uh, using a variety of tools, which I'll go into in a couple of minutes. Um, we also do we also do things such as neighborhood revitalization projects. Most of those deal with commercial revitalization, but we've also done projects uh, that deal with um, uh, apartment buildings and uh, condominium communities. Um, we also house the code enforcement uh, division uh, of the Montgomery County uh, government. So we're responsible for housing code enforcement. Uh, we're also responsible for uh, rental licensing. So anybody who runs a rental property, uh, you have to get, a, you have to pay for your annual license through us and uh, do various kinds of reporting. We also house the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs, uh, which provides a variety of services to tenants and landlords, as well as mediation services uh, between the two. We also house the Office of Common Ownership Communities. Uh, that office helps to instruct uh, condominiums and cooperatives about their rights and responsibilities under Montgomery County and uh, Maryland law 
And as with the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs, we also provide uh, mediation and some adjudication uh, services uh, for common ownership communities. Um, and I'm trying to think of, those are the main outward, for, for outward facing aspects of the department. Uh, we also have our finance and administration division, uh, which handles uh, internal things. So turning back to the preservation and creation of affordable housing, um, we have a variety of tools and funds available to us to achieve these goals. Uh, the main fund is the Housing Initiative Fund, and there are many different things uh, that are that reside in the Housing Initiative Fund. Uh, for example, there is rental assistance, which resides there, which passes through us and is administered by the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but the main ones that you probably uh, would be most interested in, um, actually, hang on one second. Sorry about that. Uh, since it's in the evening, I'm doing this from home and my, my son is, is busy eating in the other room and being a little noisy. So I was uh, letting him know to keep it a little quiet. Um, and so let's see, where was I? Housing Initiative Fund and the various different types of affordable housing funding. So um, we have within the HIF the ability to uh, provide uh, short and long-term uh, capital investment in affordable housing projects, whether that be new construction or the rehab of existing construction. Uh, we also have, as of the past year or so, a couple of new funds, which are, which are part of the HIF, and that is the fund, the um, Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, that is used for short-term acquisition. So those are loans to help with the acquisition of properties that are expected to, be, to pay back within three years. We also have a subdivision within the Housing Initiatives Fund for naturally occurring affordable housing. So NOAA, N-O-A-H. And what that means is that we sort of divide up a portion of the HIF so that it can only be used for uh, the purchase or rehab of existing properties. Um, part of the rationale for doing that is that we have developers all the time who are interested in purchasing existing affordable housing or building new affordable housing. Um, and we could spend the entire uh, housing initiative fund that's devoted to capital investment just on developers coming to us. But what we decided to do before I came here, but I agree with what they did, uh, we segregated off part of that into this naturally occurring affordable housing fund. And what that is focused on are properties that come through our right of first refusal program. Not sure if, it, if everyone's familiar with that, uh, it's a program that's been around since the early mid 80s. Uh, we were one of the early jurisdictions, uh, Washington DC uh, beat us to it um, by a few years. And what the right of first refusal offers is the Housing Opportunities Commission. So that is our Montgomery County Housing Authority, as well as the Montgomery County government and tenants who live at a particular at the particular property, the right of first refusal when the property goes up for sale. And we have certain timelines that we have uh, to exer to declare our interest in exercising. Uh, the same goes for the Housing Opportunities Commission, HOC, and tenants. Um, and I'm happy to go into this more in detail, uh, if you'd like. But what this allows us to do, if say the county or HOC exercise, is to take on an existing contract that's been negotiated at arm's length uh, between the property owner and a third party. So that establishes that the right of first refusal is not a taking under the constitution. 
So the right of first refusal establishes the terms and conditions and the price of the contract. And then we are able to step into the contract to take over the contract at that price and at those terms. And because those, those opportunities for a right of first refusal could come up at any time during the year, it's important to have some of that money segregated that can be used for the acquisition or long-term uh, funding for these projects to make sure we're able to take advantage of the opportunity to preserve affordable housing uh, at existing affordable product projects. I'll stop there just for a second. Um, we've got some more tools that I can talk about if you'd like, but before I go too much further, I just wanted to ask if anybody has any questions about those before I go any further. I'll ask a question. Does the right of first refusal apply to single family dwellings or is it uh, larger multi, uh, uh, larger buildings? Four plus, uh, four units and larger. Thanks. Sure. In other jurisdictions, uh, it can go down to the single family level, um, but Montgomery County says four units and up. And how do you find out about these properties that are coming up? Do people just, do all these owners just know that they're supposed to give you this or how does, how does it work? Yes, it's, it's part of the law um, that when an owner um, has negotiated a contract, the terms and price, they have to notify the county the Housing Opportunities Commission, uh, and the tenants who live at the property. And so then once we receive that notice, um, the, the, the HOC and the county both have 60 days to notify the property owner if they want to exercise their right of first refusal. And they also have to take on the contract and put down a deposit on the property. Uh, tenants, on the other hand, if they choose to exercise, they have 45 days to form a tenant organization or tenant association, and then another 45 days to take on the contract and put down a deposit. So tenants have a total of 90 days for their initial deadline, whereas the government or HOC has a total of 60 days. Scott, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, now, a lot of people talk about affordable housing, but they don't really define what that means and what type of housing is uh, equates to affordable housing. Um, how has anyone done a study to determine whether single family homes or apartments make up the lion's share of the affordable housing in Montgomery County? I mean, it seems to me that the naturally occurring affordable housing in my opinion, probably dominates uh, the, the realm of, of creating housing for, for people who need it. And, it, and, and the way we're heading, we're going to be digging a hole because those people, you know, the landlords are going to have this, this incentive to take advantage of uh, our right multiplex housing. And I don't see how you and com Housing Community Affairs can keep up with that that void with that 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 abscess that that's going to you know be relieving itself do you, you understand what i mean yeah what what's more is it is it apartments is it housing and how do you plan on meeting keeping up with the loss should landlords take advantage of uh, multiplex housing so to to answer the first part of your question uh, housing affordability is relative. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll give you some, some parameters uh, to, to think about. Low income households, uh, according to the federal government, kind of are in three tiers. Um, and so zero to 30% of the area households earning zero, so no income at all, to 30% of the area median income are, are considered extremely low income. Households making from 31 to 50% of the area median income are considered very low income, and houses making 61 to 80% of the area median income 
are considered low income. From 81 to up to 120% of the area median income is considered moderate, uh, is considered moderate income. And so we have, so locally, and we locally and the state and the federal government have different programs to try to reach, to try to make housing affordable to folks at those various different income bands. And so when you think of folks at zero to 30% of the area median income, really the only, sorry, there is almost no other program for zero to 30% AMI households other than Section 8 vouchers or public housing. Uh, the, the, the federal government really started disinvesting in zero to 30% housing solutions during the Reagan administration. Um, and that has continued on to the present. Um, you know, zero to 30%, you know, like Section 8 vouchers or public housing are. Uh, you know, continuing to shrink every year. In the 31 to 50% band, there are very few programs of any type uh, locally or, or statewide or nationally that, that focus on that income band. And so nothing's really dealing with that. In, there's a federal program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credits that came out of the late Reagan administration, and it was supposed to be a private sector solution to the affordable housing problem. But low-income housing tax credits, or LIHTC for short, LIHTC focuses generally on 50 or 60% of area median income. And so it's really kind of focused on the third up tier of low income folks, those are at low income. It ignores extremely low and very low income. And that LIHTC, just a thumbnail sketch of that, it provides tax credits to major corporate institutions, lots of times banks and things like that. Um, they pay over capital in order to get federal tax credits. That capital is investing, invested in the construction or rehabilitation of um, uh, of housing. And then locally, we have the moderately priced dwelling unit program. And that focuses on at 60 to 70% of area median income. Um, and then we have other uh, like uh, affordable home ownership programs that focus on higher, uh, higher groups than that, uh, but not much that deals with, with rental. And so to uh, Mr. Lamari, the, it really, you know, like it, we're trying to fill different buckets and we have those different programs um, to try to fill those buckets with the needed affordable housing and to, you know, follow up on where you were going. No, we don't have enough money on the federal level, on the state level or on the local level to provide all the affordable housing that we need at any of those income bands. And it's been, we've been in an affordable housing crisis since the, the late 1960s. And public awareness of that go, it ebbs and flows. Um, because, you know, if you look back at the 70s um, and the early 80s, when multiple places around the country, including Montgomery County, instituted rent stabilization laws. It was in response to affordable housing crises and you know, rising interest rates uh, you know, and uh, you know, like some difficult economic fluctuations. Um, and same kind of thing with condo conversion laws and things like that. Um, there were, you know, and you've probably seen in the news that over the past, decade, decade and a half, there's been a real focus on the affordable housing crisis. Um, and again, it kind of ebbs and flows. But I mean, I've been, you know, working in this field since the early 2000s. Um, and there has been a the general public narrative about the affordable housing crisis during most of that time. 
uh, governments have really picked up on it over the past 10 to 15 years and instituted more and more programs and are spending more and more money on it. Um, so I, I've gone, I probably told you more than you wanted about that, um, but I'm happy to answer follow-up questions. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Alan? Can some, you or someone else keep track of the questions that are in the chat? It's hard for me to keep track of those. There's a, there's a, there's a few of them, but I see that uh, Liz Joyce, your hand is raised for a comment or question. Yes, I wanted to ask, um, you're detailing in, in very helpful ways, the various tools that you have to address these needs, but you're saying that they're uh, not sufficient to meet the need. Also, the kinds of trends that are taking place are encouraging the disappearance of moderately placed dwelling units. And uh, I'm wondering if the county has any tactics to address that because uh, that, is a, that is a huge issue. Uh, the, de the developers are, have no uh, constraints against purchasing and converting to more expensive units, these moderately priced, rather not placed, moderately priced dwelling units. And are there any uh, tools to address that trend, which is very concerning to everybody who wants to make sure that people have adequate housing? Sure. So first thing, when I when I use the phrase moderately priced dwelling units, that's um, that's an actual program uh, that's right. been around for a few decades, and those are over the those from the past decade forward they're preserved for 99 years so even if a new developer buys it they still have to abide by the um, affordability restrictions that, that said there are issues with the mpdu program and i know county executive elrich is interested in uh, reforming the program to some degree uh, that said, if we're talking about moderately priced dwelling units, you know, without the acronym in a colloquial sense, um, uh, you know, like some naturally occurring affordable housing, um, there are the, the right of first refusal is our main tool to deal with that because we can effectively preempt the sale to a developer that's interested in taking something up market and you know, using uh, government funds and other types of affordable housing lending funds to preserve, uh, you know, like in a legal fashion, you know, a covenant that runs with the land uh, or other type of agreement uh, to preserve affordability of those properties. But as with everything uh, that government spends money on, um, unless people want their taxes raised a lot, uh, there are difficult decisions that are, need to be made between um, schools and roads and, you know, like, uh, and, uh, you know, public safety, fire departments, affordable housing, a variety of programs. And so also there is honestly an ideological component to this. Um, as you know, you all are, you know, like there are a lot of people uh, who don't like uh, right of first refusal or opportunity to purchase programs because they consider it interference in the private market. Um, uh, you know, other things that we can do, uh, you probably noticed um, over the past week that there have been two rent stabilization bills uh, that were introduced, one by the county executive and council members Mink and, and Jawando, and another one by several other council members. And there are lots of rent stabilization programs they they moderate how much they stabilize how much rents can go up each year whereas right now in montgomery county you can raise the rent as much as you want you can raise it 100 percent still legal um but folks have you know you probably noticed the media if you've read these things people have very different opinions about this some folks think that rent stabilization is a social good that needs to be done uh because our housing system is out of whack because we haven't interfered enough in the market. Other folks think that if you interfere in the market by uh, stabilizing uh, you know, how much rents can go up, then 
uh, housing developers are all going to sell their properties and no one will want to live here and we'll all live, you know, end up like Detroit. Um, and so I, I have a particular perspective on that. So does the county executive. But I know that people have, you know, very strong, you know, feelings about that. Our other speaker has a question for you. So sure. Mr. O'Grady. It's not so much a question as a comment about LIHTC. Uh, given the prices in the area and given the opportunity cost for developers, it's only a viable incentive when you're constructing mass units, like say an apartment built complex and like 10 or not 10, like 20 or 100 or 400 units, then LIHTC becomes viable. If you're flipping, if you're buying a proper, like a single family home or a duplex, and flipping it, the opportunity cost is so great that you're not going to take advantage of it and make it a low income property. Yeah, well, the, general, the, general, the general rule of thumb is that LIHTC really doesn't work in properties smaller than 50 units, five zero. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you can make LIHTC work with properties smaller than 50 units if you do a LIHTC pool. Mm -hmm. And that is if a particular developer buys up a group of properties, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, uh, you know, one at a time, mm -hmm. or happens to buy a group that, you know, like, that hasn't been, you know, of separate properties that are owned by one portfolio. Um, the difficulty with a LIHTC pool is it's not always easy to get all those properties under your ownership in a timely fashion. Um, to keep them moving forward um, and functioning while you're waiting to for them all to be in line to be eligible for LIHTC. And so one of the issues nationwide, um, we our affordable housing system as it is for rehab or new construct, well, for for rehab, for rehab of existing properties works best with properties that are 50 units or larger. Um, and we've got a pretty decent system for, you know, there are haves and haves not nots in it, but single family housing, uh, you know, kind of works well. And most of the affordability related to single family housing deals with down payment assistance or other things like that. Uh, for properties that are really kind of four units to 50 units, there are not really good um, tools in place to preserve affordability at these properties. So, you know, smaller rental properties, smaller garden style apartment complexes. Um, and before I left the District of Columbia, I had spent the past few years uh, working with folks there on trying to come up with solutions for those kind of four to 50 unit properties to try to preserve them because I don't know the housing stock as well in Montgomery County, mm -hmm. yet, but in the District of Columbia, uh, a significant, uh, I would say a majority of the housing stock for rental housing is, is in four to 50 unit buildings. And it's just being kind of left unprotected. So what was your opinion on the proffer system that the DC government ended up adopting after Columbia Heights? The which system? The pro like proffering developers for affordable, co like covenanted units for affordable development. Um, you mean after Columbia? You have to give me a little more context. Okay, so I mean, so when Columbia Heights they adopted an upzoning process similar to what Arlington County is trying to do, probably more extreme. Um, basically, a lot of units became unaffordable, and the DC government started negotiating with developers. Like you set aside X amount of, of units for affordable housing, we'll give you the permit. Which year was that? Sometime after, like sometime in the early twenty or mid twenty tens. I'm not a huge expert on DC housing policy per se, just because I mostly research in places south of that, but I've heard of, I've heard Mario Bowser talk a lot about that, about the idea of negotiating with developers for for covenanted units. Oh, so that is cash for covenants. That's mm -hmm. something that actually doesn't exist yet. Um, okay. 
So um, a, a interesting. I was my old professor Derek Heyer at American. Like he, you led me to believe that it was. So I apologize for that. No, 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 no worries, no worries. It's um, so a um, a think tank or policy center that's funded by the major developers in DC came up with the idea uh, for cash mm -hmm. for covenants. Um, and uh, Robert White, uh, a council member, uh, proposed a bill about it. And soon after, Muriel Bowser, Mayor Bowser, um, uh, proposed adopting the plan, you know, sort of one-upmanship mm -hmm. on it. And it they passed $5 million as sort of a pilot thing to set it up. Mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, it was supposed to be included, but they, they never <laughs> they never implemented it. And that was two or three years ago. And mm -hmm. so it, nothing ever came of it. It was kind of a flawed program. It was sort of an end run. Uh, a lot of for-profit developers have always been against rent stabilization in the district. And what they were, they proposed that as an end run around rent stabilization where they were like, if you want to pay for affordability, then pay us money and we'll keep rents at a certain level. But because in the district, if you have a property, if you have a unit that has a covenant on it, mm -hmm. it's exempt from rent stabilization. And so it was their end run around rent stabilization to try to say, you know, pay us to stabilize rents at this property instead of making it, you know, part of the law. Um, that said, you can do in the District of Columbia, they have something we don't have here called the Local Rent Supplement Program. And that's their version of the Section 8 program. It has, just like Section 8, it has two different mm -hmm. types. It has tenant based, and that's where you have a voucher that the tenant carries with them to any apartment or, or house they want to rent, or project based where the subsidy is attached to the unit and anyone renting that unit must be of a certain income level um, and will only have to pay 30% of their mm -hmm. of their income toward the rent of that property and uh, that unit and then the rest is subsidized by the, the government subsidy. Um, I got more you. into that if you'd like. Scott, there's a couple of questions in the chat that you asked us to monitor, and uh, maybe you can answer these questions. I mean, some of them are kind of specifics, like uh, Matt Quinn asks, what percent of the new development at the Lake Forest Mall property has been identified as affordable housing? So that's going to be a big project up in Gaithersburg. Do you have an idea what percent is going to be affordable housing? I do not know, but based on uh, a, a public meeting I went to a few days ago, I, I thought that that was yet to be determined, but I'm not positive. Sorry, my, I've got some distractions in my, in my household too. Another question yeah. is what kind of incentives are erupting? Are there any percent incentives being provided to police to help them reside in the county? Oh, um, let's see. There is, gosh, if you were asking me about this, about DC, I could tell you back and forward. Um, there is a Montgomery County employee down payment assistance program, uh, and there are Montgomery County employees. I, I honestly don't know. I've, I've, I just started my job on January 1st, um, so I haven't memorized all the different programs yet. Um, but I don't know if there is kind of like a first responder uh, down payment assistance program, but I know there is one for Montgomery County employees. I, I believe the council member, former council member Tom Hucker introduced in a bill for first, rep first responders down payment assistance. And I think that is currently in effect, but we can follow up for the, the audience. Uh, Kate Myers asked you, when you were talking about the levels of AMI, one to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 80, mm -hmm. um, she wanted to know, is it true to say that those at the zero to 30, 30 to 60 and 67 bands primarily live in multifamily rental units? Are they mostly renters? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, 
you have a variety of circumstances. There are folks who are living in what, there are some folks who are living in what uh, the county or many jurisdictions would consider overcrowded uh, situations where, you know, doubling or tripling up of families uh, in order to afford the rent. Um, you have folks in lower income, lower cost areas of the county uh, who may be homeowners uh, who happen to be at 50% of AMI. Um, I notice, I'm just guessing, that there are a few senior citizens on today. And there are some senior citizens who moved in uh, to their home, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago uh, and are on a fixed income now. And their fixed income may be may put them in that 40, 50, 60 percent of AMI range, but because they bought their home a long time ago, and because of some restrictions on you know being priced out by property taxes, they're able to kind of age in place, uh, even though you know under their current income they'd never be able to buy a home um, if if they didn't already have one uh, in the county. And so there are, you know, a wide range of circumstances. Um, and, you know, you can find uh, for folks 50, 60, 70, 80% of AMI, uh, you can find apartments that you can, like, it's quote unquote afford. Uh, it all depends on how much you're spending out of your, out of your income. You know, affordable is termed as spending no more than 30% of your income. Uh, there are lots of folks who are spending 50, 60, 70, 80 percent um, just, you know, just for their housing and, you know, doing their best to figure out where they're going to, you know, how they're going to get food and, and how they're going to pay for transportation. Well, thank you very much. Liz? Yes, um, I am. I have we, I'm not sure we've covered all the questions that everyone has. Uh, is anyone still um, interested in asking a question? Well, I, I'll ask a question. So um, hopefully you'll be our next director of housing community affairs, Scott. So my fingers crossed about that. Well, if you, if you want that to happen, you probably need to say something to somebody. <laughs> Right, so uh, we we can we can, we can do that. And I was your experience in um, in D in DC looks like the mayor there. No relation, by the way. Maybe a cousin, but no no relation. Um, she's put a lot of money into uh, affordable housing. I mean, hundreds of millions, maybe almost a billion dollars over the course of a period of time, and uh, projects are popping up all over all over the city. Um, what was your perception of what the DC government was doing um, in uh, accessory dwelling units, ADUs? Um, do they have a program like we have on MPDUs? And uh, is there a debate in DC about missing middle housing and how to uh, incorporate that into the housing stock? Sure. Um, so let's see uh, where to start with these. Um, what do I think of what uh, Mayor Bowser was doing? Uh, she did spend, she has spent over a billion dollars. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, they did, I mean, the organization I previously worked for um, for several years uh, kind of created the narrative uh, that got a lot, that got Vince Gray first and then Mayor Bowser uh, to really invest significantly in their housing production trust fund. That same organization also back in 2008 or so convinced them to start the local rent supplement program. Um, and so DC has some advantages in that it is, a, is like a state in some ways, as far as, uh, you know, like federal rights and funding, definitely not a state in other ways that really count. Um, uh, but they've put a lot of money, uh, more per capita than any other jurisdiction in the country. Um, and so some of that deals with political will. And you've seen uh, recently over the past few years that the county executive and the county council uh, have put more money into these affordable housing uh, funds than they ever have before. And so hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, that'll, that'll continue to, to increase over time. Um, 
one of the things I criticized DC about is uh, it uh, is has transparency issues um, uh, about how it spends some of the money. In general, they've done a good job, but there's been lots of accusations of favoritism. Uh, developers, you'll not be surprised, uh, are some of the are some of the biggest political players on the in the scene uh, in DC. So you'll have to remind me of the other two parts. Of which other? Two? Oh no, I remember. I remember. Um, the MPDU program, yes, the District of Columbia has something called inclusionary zoning, uh, which is what the MPDU program is called um, uh, in most other places in the country. And that's where for you know, a certain amount of bonus density to build more units, you have to do a certain percentage of units affordable at certain restricted levels for um, you know, generally now it's it's 99 years. And then, gosh, what was the third one you asked me? Um, accessory dwelling units and then yes. missing middle. Yes, they have accessory dwell, they have an accessory dwelling unit program uh, uh, like, you know, similar to here uh, that encourages folks to use extra land on their single family house site uh, to create um, you know, an in-law suite or, you know, like an income generating um, extra fund. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile way to create extra housing and it's, I usually think of things as a continuum of housing. You need all kinds of different tools to get at this crisis we have. No one of them is going to solve the crisis. Um, and so more power to ADUs, not everyone's going to do them. They are not in and of themselves going to solve the crisis, neither are moderately priced dwelling units, and you know, like it's on and on and on. Um, and then missing middle housing. People define missing middle housing in a few different ways. Um, some folks look at it as the garden style apartments that used to predominate um, in lots of rental communities around the country um, and that no one builds anymore, especially not in high cost areas because the cost of land is so great that you end up doing one of two things with high cost land. You build single family homes for very well off people, which I'm sure none of you have seen in any of your neighborhoods, um, or if you're building multifamily uh, residential, um, you tend to build a lot more units than garden style because the cost of the land is so great. You need more units in order to, uh, you know, make a profit on what you're doing. And so, yes, uh, you know, DC like Montgomery County has a lot of garden style apartments uh, that are of an age, you know, post-World War II, you know, up through the 60s and 70s. Um, and, uh, but they are land constrained far more than Montgomery County is. Um, I mean, we've got, we, we have the agricultural preserve, but we have, we do have more land than the district does to build low, low density residential. Um, but you could also look at uh, another way to look at missing middle is the kind of gap between subsidized, you know, subsidized housing programs and what folks who receive no kind of subsidy can afford. And so for single family housing, missing middle could also, you know, be considered to be single, you know, starter homes. Nobody builds starter homes in Montgomery County. You can't build a starter home because the land costs too much. You can build starter homes in, in exurbs, um, you know, in the middle of the country, uh, but it's really hard here. And so you get more first time home buyers who, uh, you know, end up having to be in condos and condos have their own issue. Uh, and even, you know, think about how many townhomes there are around in the area. Um, there are not a tremendous number of townhomes either. Um, and so uh, missing middle is, it can, be a it can be a complex array of things uh, that get at uh, lacunae in, um, in the affordable housing continuum. I think Mr. O'Grady's got his hand up. 
Yeah, so I just want to make one comment about starter homes. Historically, they have been a bit of an anomaly. We saw them pop up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s only because the federal government, through the now defunct Federal Housing Agency, issued these massive block grants to a lot of builders post World War II. And to get the block grant, it was like you had to build an entire subdivision of starter homes, affordable homes, where you didn't get the grant at all. And that's why we saw like these single. I was a single family, single floor detached homes, like what I live in now in Arlington. It was really the only way those were ever really built in any large quantity and that became affordable is because of, again, these massive federal subsidies, which died a lot, dried up a long time ago. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely right. And then combine that with, um, you know, the changes that were made in the mortgage system during the during the uh during the new deal that we really didn't see the fruition of until after world war ii yes and then you saw in the dodd frank act which is like a, basically an overcorrection where fannie and freddie no longer have to give specified or buy a specified number of low-income mortgages anymore and i don't like that i mean we, we're still studying the effects of that but i think I, again like I think we're talking about like the pendulum on um, opposite swings of the spectrum there, but yeah, like, but that that has affected a lot of this stuff historically. Um, the other thing I want to comment on is like this is something a long time ago, you, you said a long time ago, um, comparatively speaking, the Hope Six program that sprang about in the 1980s and 90s. You saw the federal health like the. Department of Housing and Urban Development, they would pay for demolition, they wouldn't pay for replacement or rehabilitation. And we lost a lot of affordable housing stock just because cities wanted to be rid of them. Um, another thing that doesn't get talked about enough is there was a Supreme Court case in the 1930s that basically forbade the federal government from directly building or operating a lot of affordable housing. Like that had to, that was. 10th Amendment violation. So they had, so that's why you see HUD, that's why HUD has been contracting with state and local governments ever since. And this has produced a lot of uneven results, to put it mildly. Yeah, it's you know, like the old bugaboo of, of socialism creeping upon us. And so. Mm -hmm. We have a couple more questions I'd like to uh, entertain before we move on to Mr. O'Grady. Uh, Peggy Dennis, could you uh, let us know what you'd like to ask? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Uh, all the discussion so far has been about people being able to live in discrete units, whether they be apartments or single family homes or duplexes or whatever. I haven't heard anything about any kind of program to incentivize or even allow home sharing. In our case, we have opened our home and shared it with a refugee family many years ago, with young people with very little money who only wanted a bed sit and didn't want or need a full kitchen, washer, dryer, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see why the county is so focused on wanting the certain level which they define of amenities for every unit. What rather, I, I should say we have a lot of people, older people in relatively large homes who are rattling around, who would like to have company, who would like to be able to rent out a bedroom or a bed sit at very low cost because they rent, because they don't need the money but they would like companionship. They would like other people to be in their dwelling unit and they'd share it with them. I think, um, I mean, number one, uh, the, you know, like I don't think that's ever been outlawed, but then a few years ago, um, or is it several now, uh, laws were passed in Montgomery County um, to enable the existing sharing, you know, quote unquote sharing economy of like Airbnb, and other programs like that where people actually do rent out their basement or their or a bedroom um and so those kinds of services uh you know like i would say online platforms exist to facilitate those kinds of rentals 
within one's home if one would like to do that. Thank you. Uh, Lloyd Gersey. Um, the District of Columbia, the May, uh, let's see, am I muted or unmuted? You're here. Thank you. The District of Columbia has begun an initiative to uh, use um, empty office buildings, et cetera, for housing. Um, in Montgomery County, we've got a lot of storefronts, which for years now have been vacant. The likelihood of retail re-establishing itself in those storefronts is about zero. We have vacant office space, which like the district is never going to be reutilized. Uh, what programs is Montgomery County gonna have, as the district does start to have a program, to start utilizing this unutilized space? Oh, that's an excellent question. I actually um, did a, um, a report for the DC government about four or five years ago about conversion of office space to uh, residential, multifamily residential housing, you know, like either condos or rentals. And they were particularly focused on the downtown. You know, they, they, uh, this was even before, the, this was before the pandemic. And there are, and they wanted to produce affordable housing. They were office to affordable housing conversion. They were interested in that. And what we found out from a several month study is that it is, the, it is cost prohibitive to try to convert existing office space into affordable housing. It is less cost prohibitive to convert existing office space into high rent or high cost housing. And for a few different reasons. One, the building codes are different for office versus residential. The requirements for plumbing, uh, stairs and elevators. Windows. Ac yeah, windows, access to natural light are different. And so the, uh, the retrofitting of an existing office space can be really cost prohibitive. And so in looking at trying to convert office space to um, residential, usually that added retrofit cost plus the subsidy to make it affordable housing is so high that it would be better to spend the money on building a brand new building. On the other hand, when D, the, the program DC passed about a year, no, two years ago now, um, which it provides, it's focused on certain areas of the downtown uh, because they've had uh, you know, people fleeing because of COVID uh, downtown uh, office space, is that they will get certain types of government grants or tax abatements if you convert an existing downtown, you know, we're talking class A or class B office property into housing, not affordable housing, housing. You also have to provide a certain percentage of it as affordable to folks at 60% of the area median income sort of like an, I, an inclusionary zoning or MPDU program for the conversion. That said, I should say that it is more affordable to convert class C, off, class D or C office space it's into reasonably affordable housing because you know, it's usually lower rise, uh, the conversion costs would not be as high, um, and the competition for other uses is not as high. That said, depending on how the building is built, you might be better off just tearing it down and building something. I mean, to me, getting at that is more about enabling mixed use zoning um, so that you can have both commercial and residential on the same lot. Because um, there's a lot of low rise commercial that you could effectively rehab and build higher and put residential on top of. Okay, one more question, Karen Cordry, Thank and then you. move on to Mr. O'Grady. Yeah, my question is one that was also in the chat is just kind of one of the things I live right near the Wheaton Mall and we have 
still most of our areas is relatively affordable. I mean, it's not cheap, but it's 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 on the low side. And we have these story, story and a half, two story brick Cape Cods, you know, and they're all well maintained and so forth. But we are not too much here. The person in the chat was saying it's all going that way, but we were getting the tear those down and build the McMansions in there. Is there any thought of a way to stop that, to limit that, to put a big tax on that so we can use that to, to help subsidize keeping the, the existing ones that are there? Where do we go with this uh, progressive McMansionization problem? Hmm. Well, there are all kinds of things you could do. You could put a tax on it. You could put a, you know, like a luxury tax on it if you wanted. Um, yeah, but are we? <laughs> yeah, because once you start talking about doing that, then you're, then you're getting at limiting people's property values. And yeah. so, um, and then you know, I'm sure you've all encountered stuff like that before. Homeowners are a powerful voting block. Um, and nobody likes the, you know, the possibility, you know, like they may not like the McMansion being put up next to them, but they, when they decide to sell, they want to be able to sell for McMansion conversion prices. Um, and so, you know, you could do certain kind of zoning things, you know, a neighborhood uh, could start a neighborhood association and it could restrict uh, the size of houses that could be built on it. Um, but then, you know, like there's always that push pull tension uh, between, you know, maximization of private value versus, um, uh, you know, perceived social good. Thank you so much. This is this is very interesting, and I appreciate all of the insights you have about the tools that are available at this point. The big picture, and one reason we wanted to hear from Mr. O'Grady is his excellent article in the Washington Post about missing middle, which is the elephant in the room, not only in Arlington but here in Montgomery County. The paradigm that is is implicit in Thrive Montgomery. Uh, 2050 and all the initiatives that the council seems to be moving toward is that missing middle is the solution to everything. If we only upzone and allow three units on a lot instead of a McMansion, for example, then we will be able to solve our housing problems. And as Mr. Grady pointed out, that is not only simplistic, but also probably a recipe for great damage to the group of people who are lower income who are expected to be the largest group coming here. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for your insights and Mr. O'Grady, take it away with whatever you have to share with us. Well, I just wanted to follow up with the latest question and with Scott's response. Residential property taxes make up the lion's share of any county's revenue and they are not gonna to wanna to do things that will limit that. So even if there was this massive movement among homeowners to limit McMansions or, or, or assessment increases, the county is highly incentivized to find ways to kill that. And they will, uh, most, most of the time, they will find a way to do that because they are the ones writing the bureaucracy. They know all the tricks and all, and all the tactics and they, Quite frankly, a seasoned politician is a very good legal and bureaucratic knife fighter, like whereas a more loosely organized coalition is not. So it's just like that. So it also comes down to the basic idea of political game theory. But I just wanted to follow up with that brief observation before I get into my actual presentation. Scott, did you have any follow up comment to that? Uh, no, I, I I absolutely agree with you. I will say the county executive, you know, is is sort of a different animal than you know the average politician on those things. But I mm -hmm. did I do want to say uh, thank you all. I'm going to turn off my camera, but I want to sit and uh, listen uh, to Mr. O'Grady's uh, presentation. Um, and uh, I'm going to eat dinner with my son uh, mm -hmm. while I listen in. But it was a pleasure uh, speaking with you all, and I really appreciate the questions. Thank you so much. Please stay with us. Okay, so now I'm going to try to share my screen. Here we go. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes, thank you. 
So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael O'Grady. I am a research development economist and GIS analyst. I mostly operate in academia, though I do some consulting for local government on the side. Um, unlike Scott, I am not a PhD yet, but you talk to me in a year where I hope to be finished with my degree, my PhD in public policy, where I spend most of my research on community level development. Um, a lot of this was initially centered around workforce and entrepreneurial development, but I backed into issues of housing policy very quickly, as one can imagine. And if this sounds like the exact type of person this area needs in terms of expertise, it's because I was born and raised in the DMV. Um, I split my time between Arlington and Southeast DC growing up in the 80s and 90s. My grandmother lived in Bethesda, so I spent a lot of time over there as well. So I consider myself a proud son of the entire DMV that way. Um, so as you know, Arlington County is very well along in their process of missing middle. And as you can tell by my title of my presentation, I have very strong opinions on that. So as someone talked about earlier, we see this idea of new urbanist philosophy guiding a lot of municipal level county housing policy. So just wanted to get in, into a little bit of background on that. And new urbanism arose as cities declined in the 1980s. Um, we saw light flight, we saw industries leave for suburbia or offshore. So to sort of fill this vacuum, a lot of things came up with coalesce around this new urbanism philosophy, not so much because of the of evidence based, but because of necessity, because because they were thrown to the wolves by both the state and federal governments, and they basically had to find their own way. And in new urbanism, it preaches that vibrant, diverse communities can be realized with optimal spatial design, zoning use, and tra tax credit policies. So the strengths of this theory are fairly straightforward. It is simple to understand. It is easy and expensive to implement. Markets do the heavy lifting in terms of deciding how to allocate resources, how to price goods and services, which if a government did that would become very political very quickly and also very contentious. But again, by sort of outsourcing this decision making to the private market, new urbanism bypasses a lot of that. Uh, Mr. O'Grady, we can yes. see both your screen and uh, like a smaller screen showing the next slide and any notes. Uh, okay. Can you sort of you yes, just I make can. it big in there? Right. Okay, thanks. There we go. We have PowerPoint open on two different windows. It's hard to tell which one you're selecting. Right. Does that everyone see just my presentation? Yes, that's great. Okay, so 30 years of data show that new urbanism doesn't foster social mixing. And by social mixing, I'm referring to what a lot of people call the Jane Jacobs vision for the future. Um, Jane Jacobs, for those of you who don't know, was a famous sociologist who did a lot of case studies as cities declined. And her solution to that was if you had a multi-ethnic, multi-class neighborhood, it would be very resilient to all sorts of social and economic pressures. But again, we haven't, we haven't seen them as more and more cities adopt new urbanism. What we do see is gentrification. What we do see is class tension. We see new designs for public space that have often become exclusionary to those who previously lived there. A good example of this is what happened to the Metropolitan Baptist Church on U Street. As U Street gentrified, a lot of the incoming, a lot of the in-movers viewed the church and its members as too homophobic, too religious, too exclusionary. So they ended up taking over a lot of the AMCs and a lot of the levers of district government and basically used redesigned zoning and spatial use policies to, to this existing historical church away from U Street. 
Um, we also see, again, as I just said, new urban policy is this highly correlated with gentrification and displacement. And for those who are housing insecure in new urbanist cities that are experiencing gentrification, we see a variety of public policy problems. This includes mental, the mental health of those residents facing displacement. You see increased family tensions such as domestic violence and divorce. You see physical health de deteriorate. And along with that, you will see career problems increase due to longer commutes increased stress, increased bad behaviors. And then finally, you will see anxiety, not just among the parents, but also children for those who are housing vulnerable. Um, oftentimes they do a lot, they, their school performance goes down, their, again, their socialization skills go down. They, you see a lot of more anger and tension. So this is, a map of Washington, D.C. at what is known as the Puma level that I have been doing as part of an ongoing research project. And at the Puma level, I've studied changes in what I call long-term vulnerable housing populations. Those who are who lived at their current address for five or more years, they pay more than 60% of their rent, or 60% of their income, neither rent or mortgages. So you can see in many areas that this percentage has gone down. So the question then becomes, why has it gone down? Are these people getting better jobs or are they being displaced? Um, again, the problem with housing displacement gen is that it's very hard to demonstrate why a person left. Um, again, since we don't see a lot of like-for-like -like housing successions among this group of people, it is reasonable to assume that they've been priced out of certain areas. Um, so again, looking at this map, you see a lot of this, what is possibly displacement in parts of DC where, again, Col the Columbia Heights renovation was. Um, you see a little less in the Brooklyn area. You see it downtown at the, where the National Waterfront was redeveloped. You're starting to see gentrifications of area of of sentence distraction in Anacostia. Um, another thing to keep in mind is a lot of people in Northwest DC are becoming more housing insecure, and this of this uh, under examined for a lot of reasons. I think the biggest one is collecting data on on these populations has been is in, incredibly time and resource consuming. And a lot of local governments just do not have the resources or incentives to invest in a vulnerable population that is arguably declining. So now I wanna to go to my home county of Arlington. And Arlington, according to the latest census figures is about 72% white. However, you see certain pockets of of majority minority census tracts clustered mostly in the south and towards the Potomac River. Um, so the county decided that it wants to adopt, the county is leaning towards adopting a very specific missing middle proposal. Um, they will hold their final vote this Saturday, and there are about three or four versions of the same option that they're being considered. Missing middle, to six, up to six units of mostly residential zoned areas. I, missing middle will allow up to six units per lot in residential zoned areas, so long as they are 5,000 to 10,000 square feet in size. Um, the county is also proposing smaller minimum square footage requirements if they are near public transportation. And this means within a quarter mile of a bus stop or half a mile from a metro stop. Um, that will that will encompass most of the county, say, except for the very northernmost points that are border, bordering on the McLean region of Fairfax County. And for those who don't know Northern Virginia that well, McLean, that very tip of the is a very rich, very exclusive area. So basically, you're going to have this missing middle proposal affect most of the county. Again, 
smaller square footage requirement because public transportation is so meshed within Arlington. In terms of spatial requirements, you see a 16 foot minimum width for townhouses, 24 feet for semi detached or duplex housing. What I, one of the things that is very problematic, at least for me, is that it only requires half of, one half of one parking space per unit. And the planning commission recommended a final version that might not have any. And again, we will find out soon on what the, what the county board's ultimate decision on this will be. So again, these units will be permitted by right, meaning no additional public review for approval. Green space requirements, and this is a major deal in Arlington where you see the communities cause massive stormwater flooding issues. Um, for example, I've had to dig a French drain and a drainage pond in the back of my yard where I'm surrounded by McMansions because of the stormwater flooding from those areas pulled into my lot. Unfortunately, I did not get reimbursed from the county for this. And you see other parts of Arlington, such as Cherrydale, where the county is actually condemning properties and demolishing them because the stormwater flooding situation has gotten so bad. And keep in mind, this is an area, Arlington County only has 29 square miles to it. So every every lot, every inch counts. So the proponent arguments in favor of missing mill are fairly straightforward. Arlington is approximately 71% non-white Hispanic. Greater housing diversity could lead to greater demographic diversity. The logic behind this is fairly superficial in my opinion. People have looked around and saw a lot of a lot of minority groups, they live in more dense housing. Ergo, if we have more dense housing, that will somehow lead to greater diversity in Arlington. I will talk about that in a moment, but I just wanted to elaborate on the logic behind this first point. The second point is the theoretical laws of supply and demand suggest that prices, price increases could be alleviated by more supply. The third argument is that this newer housing will generate more revenue for the county. And this is important again for the reasons I just talked about, about how much uh, how much county governments are reliant on residential property taxes. The fourth argument is that single family zoning was devised during Jim Crow era. So somehow if you get rid of it, that will rectify the situation. Again, this is this hasn't really been expanded upon that much, but this is an argument you keep on seeing both within the county planning reports and by proponents on the outside. And then finally, the stormwater runoff that I just talked about from the, the McMinichin file housing that has taken over, uh, is slowly taking over most of Arlington. So for example, I bought I bought my parents' house that was the only reason why I could afford to live here. But growing up, like not, it was all one floor single family detached housing. Now there's only out of 28 units on my block, only four are left, and everything else is McMansions. And that is the trend that develops most of North Arlington and is starting to creep into South Arlington as well. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Arlington County, the northern parts of the county are the more wider, they're richer. Um, South Arlington has, has historically seen many African American enclaves. Some of them were displaced during the construction of the Pentagon and the interstate highway system. Um, only one majority minority neighborhood exists north of Arlington. It's an area called Hollis Hills, which is about roughly 50-50 non-Hispanic white and everyone else at the stage though. So now I'm gonna to get to the opponent arguments. Um, for full disclosure, I am not a member of any of these groups. However, I have had many conversations with Arlington's for Sustainable Future and I have appeared on a panel for them. But again, I do not have any direct coordination with a lot of other talking points. But 
the talking points are this, that this will lead to higher taxes for all, and this will ironically cause displacement. And the reason for this is threefold. Uh, increased market pressures on the underlying land will bid up rent and bid up property taxes. Um, inflating the averages will inflate individual assessments for, for existing properties using the formula that the county uses to assess its property value. And finally, increased real, real estate speculation, especially by outside firms. And we saw that a lot in, in South Arlington right after Amazon announced that, that their HQ2 decision would locate in the South Arlington. You had a, a lot of single family homes and a lot of condos, which have been on the market for three to six months, all bought up within a week of the HQ2 decision and all by outside investment firms. So, Secondly, in many care, in many areas where missing mill housing types are currently allowed, these areas are becoming less diverse and more expensive, not the other way around. Again, the historic African American neighborhood called Halls Hills, which I've just mentioned, also the Boston area. Um, we saw recently in Boston a, a single family home built in the 1950s was bought by developers for $700,000. It was turned into a pair of duplexes, both of which sold for 1.2 million each. So obviously, that is not the direction that we we in Arlington County want to go with this. Ironically enough, that the county's own projections showed that such a duplex would only cost about 750 to 800 thousand um, dollars. They I, again, I will talk about flawed methodology later on, but. Their reasoning for this was that they found a similar duplex in South e Southeast Washington, D.C. that recently sold for $800,000. So they automatically assume that any new duplex in Arlington will sell for that for similar amounts. Third, there's no evidence that upzoning increases diversity or affordability. Um, I could get into a very complex regression analysis on this, but all you have to do is look at Columbia Heights and New Street before and after these areas became upzoned. You can see that they become a lot less diverse. For those of you who are not familiar with Columbia Heights, it was a historically African-American neighborhood. Before it was upzoned in the 2010s, it was 90% Black or and Hispanic. Today, it is about 70% White. Um, and the Biggest reason why it hasn't gone to say 90, 95% white as other areas of Southeast DC is because you see a lot of affordable housing covenants built in that will be there for the next 30 to 50 years. Otherwise, again, you would see the historical African American neighborhoods where Duke Ellington once was become almost entirely Caucasian. You can also look at places like Tyson's Corner and Weston and Virginia. And you can see that construction of all these high rises has led to average condos and average apartments increasing and not decreasing. So again, prima facie, there's a lot of evidence. All the evidence says that upzoning does not increase affordability. While it does have marginal increases in the amount of housing stock, you don't see this the law of supply and demand go the way we want it to. And I will, again, I will talk about that in a little bit. So under this proposal, households in Arlington would need to earn $93,000 a year to afford the cheapest of the actual missing mill construction. Meanwhile, the median salary for household is $125,000 per year. So obviously there is a huge disconnect there. So I'm going to get to my personal critiques of the county's missing mill plan. The county's analysis ignores many endogenous issues about causality versus correlation. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to get into the gory details of quantitative or research methods. I will simply say that a lot of the stuff, a lot of the data points they use are correlational and not at all causal. So if you suppress a correlational data point, you do nothing to address the underlying cause. And again, go back to the idea of, well, if you just 
well, a lot of minorities live in dense units. So if you create density in Arlington, you can increase diversity. Again, that is a correlational phenomenon, not a not a causal thing. Causal thing. My second major criticism is the data analysis that the county used was incredibly crude by 2023 20, standards. It reminds me of something that was taught in urban planning schools in the early 1980s, but again, someone with a master's degree in finance or business could have done a lot, done a much more expansive analysis using regression methods or Fourier decompositions or Laplace transformations. Again, I don't want to scare you with all these math terms, but again, like the back of the envelope calculations the county used were incredibly crude and incredibly off the mark, as I just mentioned with my duplex example. My biggest issue with the missing middle is that the county is sacrificing older market rate affordable homes for just the possibility that something more affordable will come along. And again, using that Boston example I just said, you have a 1950s era house that costs about $680,000 to $750,000 on the market. Well, new construction, again, the price at $1.2 million. Um, townhomes have reached the $1 million mark in Arlington. So, and McMansions are at $1.5 million. So again, the idea that Created from this destruction of market rate affordable units will somehow be more affordable, just isn't supported in the data. Um, it completely ignores the existing research on new urbanism. It ignores comparable case studies such as Columbia Heights and New Street that I just mentioned. Also, we have enough data from case studies such as Tompkins Square in New York and gentrification in San Francisco. You, Again, know that this New England approach just will not work the way the county claims it will work. Finally, using 2022 ACS data and regression modeling, I estimate that only about 10% of African Americans and Latinos can afford even the cheapest missing middle options. So, again, this idea of diversity just doesn't. It's just not supported in the data. So I'm next going to put on my political science hat. Um, having a degree in public policy rather than straight up economics means I also I'm also trained in a lot of the political analyses that go that goes into public administration and policy. So while a lot of the county decisions and assumptions are are illogical from national decision making economic models, they do align perfectly with models of political economy. Again, going back to the idea of raising the, the raising of revenue that I talked about earlier. The proponent groups and the county board itself have huge conflicts of interest in Arlington. Um, know enough about Montgomery County politics to make a similar claim there. Um, and knowledge and on politics probably exists only in the context of the wire, but I know that's not exactly generalizable outside of Baltimore. But again, Arlington is a political monopoly, just like Montgomery County is. Um, Arlington, the Arlington Democratic Party is very restrictive in the voting practices. And I'm not sure what Montgomery County is like on this, but in any political monopoly, it will favor those with money, time, and knowledge. It will underproduce in terms of public good and enrich only a few. Um, many county board members take an obscene amount of contributions from the out-of-state construction unions. And by out-of-state, I'm not talking about D.C. and Maryland. I'm talking about New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And there is no reason for a construction union in Central Jersey to be giving to county board members in Northern Virginia. Virginia. Again, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if a similar dynamic has been played in Montgomery County or in Maryland, but I would highly advise you to, for you to check for that. Um, you see a lot of proponent groups in Arlington also have conflicts of interest in terms of, of that this a lot of leadership serves in multiple organizations at the same time. For example, the Arlington NAACP took a 
rather full neutral approach towards the misty middle when it was first proposed in 2019. However, recently the chair of the NAACP decided he wanted to run for county board. You saw the leadership of the Arlington NAACP change their tune. However, there's this huge disconnect between the leadership and the rank and file. And this culminated in one of the past vice chairs issuing a scathing rebuke on social media of how the, of how all these institutions such as the NAACP, all these housing groups are basically betraying minorities and those most vulnerable. Developers have been very coy and non-committal about what they would build and where in, in both hearings and in discussions. They use the word could and open to impossible a lot. They don't commit to how many missing middle type units they will build. They don't commit to price points. And again, in 2023, in the era of, quote, big data science, this is very suspicious. Um, components have never attempted to address the valid data-driven empirical critiques that both myself and other and groups opposed to upzoning have issued. And just for... I want to say future reference, but just for background, I'm not opposed to the idea of upzoning per se, but I think it needs to be a lot more surgical and well thought out than what we are seeing so far with us in Arlington County. Um, finally, developers are notorious for not honoring affordability commitments. You can, I think the classic example of this comes from the Cabrini Green redevelopment in Chicago. This happened approximately, well, 23 years ago now, and I kind of feel old because that's about when I graduated from high school. But anyway, so Cabrini Green was this housing project that needed to be demolished and replaced. The city of Chicago get, turned it over to developers with, with a bunch of grants for both the city and from the housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Developers promised to maintain the same amount of affordable housing units in any new development that existed in Caprini Green before 2000. This promise did not materialize. There was no clawback or enforcement mechanism. The city of Chicago lost 10% of its affordable housing stock, and that was never replaced. So again, you see time and time again the need for, I guess, agreements with developers that have teeth to them, that have enforceability, that have some kind of punishment if they don't do what they say they're going to do. And a lot of this will tie back into something a lot, most, uh, several people in this in this meeting I've mentioned before, which is how do you define affordability? Um, developers will find it, will probably define it in a way that will maximize who they can sell to, what their, what their income brackets are. And this is very important because the United States is approaching what is known as a dual economy. And a dual economy is something you will see in a third world or in developing countries where you have this one set, one economy for the rich and one economy for the poor. And again, if you're talking about someone who earns 75% of the median income in a place like DC, that could mean an entry level computer programmer or that could mean a teacher in Arlington County with 30 years experience, but you just don't know who you're giving the affordable housing unit to. And this is a huge problem going forward when you have places, companies like Amazon, Boeing, Raytheon moving to the area, and they will attract a lot of in movers from newly minted engineering and, and STEM programs to come work here. Again, they will come in with salaries way above the average, and they will, but even though they are technically 25% below the median, they can still qualify for these units. So again, how you define and how you enforce affordability matters. So now I'm gonna talk about what the research says. And you heard me talk about 30 years of new urbanist research earlier. And I wouldn't be a good academic if I didn't self-promote. So the first study I'm going to talk about is 
a project I am doing with the Urban Affairs, it's with the Urban Affairs Association on gentrification displacement. And studying this at the Prima level using micro data from the American Community Service, American Community Survey for seven years from 2012 to 2019. I estimate that 30% of marginalized groups have become displaced in gentrifying cities. And Washington, D.C. and both the Virginia and Maryland suburbs are very high on this list. Even when proponents of new urbanism will admit that unless government intervenes more, the affordability gap will only get worse. Um, last year, the Urban Institute issued a study that said only 20% of new housing construction inside urban areas are affordable to even the median of household, earn, household earners. New construction only allows for approximately 12% of lower tier earners to move to better units. And you don't really see this until about the fifth or the sixth move, movement in the chain, which means that someone that is, that is living in one of these garden apartments that were built in the 1950s, only 12% of them might move to a slightly more modern or slightly more rehabbed garden apartment. But again, when you have a place like Washington, D.C., Montgomery County, Arlington County, where you have a massive population of in-movers, this sort of chain movement is highly diminished. So supply, and, as I just said, that supply and demand are reciprocal and they're endogenous. Developers build for higher earning new entrants in these hot markets and gentrifying cities. They ignore the current need for affordable housing. This sort of luxury higher earning focus ends up attracting new higher earning entrants into the market and the cycle repeats. Um, suffice it to say that, again, the existing need from lower lower tier groups is constantly ignored. Developers will never oversaturate the market and that's why the basic laws of supply and demand will fail when it comes to real estate. There is just too much information out there. Um, again, if you're a developer, you, you can look at county open records, you know, you, I, you know what the purchase price of an older lot is, you know who who is buying it, who is developing it. So you know how many units are currently under construction. You have very good data on what their price point is and whether this, this profit margin is increasing in, in, or decreasing. And there exists entire firms such as CoStar to make sure that large-scale developers have this information. And, then, and thus, they will never overproduce. You will never see an oversaturation in the market because of this. So. Do entrants often engage in exclusionary practices towards this existing groups? I mentioned the Metropolitan Baptist Church earlier, but we also see this in terms of how parks and community spaces are redesigned. Um, in Arlington County, you see a lot of open use places become dog walking only parks. You see a lot of athletic fields get redesigned for off and restricted in the name of public safety. Finally, market-based nonprofit construction constitutes only about five percent of unit development. If it's only about five percent for affordable housing, this would cancel each other out. But demand is much larger. And one of my critiques of both Arlington County and the Washington metropolitan area governments is that they, they haven't done any real assessment of how much demand there is currently or will or how much more affordable housing we will need in the future. Um, my personal theory on this is they don't want to know the answer because that will force them to make a harder decision. But again, that's just my personal educated opinion. I'm sure the truth is much more complicated. So as I asked Scott about Earlier, one of the potential solutions is the is the use increased use of proffers and affordable housing covenants that have present, prevented U Street and Columbia Heights from being completely emptied of their African American population. 
My own research suggests that rent control is still highly effective at keeping existing tenants in their neighborhoods. However, there is a huge trade-off, and that trade-off means that there will, it will negatively impact new unit construction overall in terms of market rate construction. Secondly, rent control laws can easily be manipulated and sunsetted by developers. Again, if, the, if these units aren't covenanted, Finally, we have the idea of quote unquote spoke density. And this was first hypothesized by a, a scholar named Richard Soja. But to give some practical examples, think about how Gaithersburg is like sort of like a spoke density off of 270. Um, again, growing up here, there wasn't really that much beyond Gaithersburg, but that's, but again, all of a sudden you get places like Rio and the surrounding area just seemingly come up out of nowhere. They were really, de again, you have a lot of density there. There's public transportation. You're not displacing, you're, you're, or you're not, I won't say you're not displacing, you're minimizing displacement compared to say, if you tried to upzone Wheaton or Bethesda. Um, a similar example would be Tyson's Corner in Virginia, where you see a lot of old, and, in Springfield, Virginia, we see like a lot of old industrial places that are no longer commercially viable being turned into high rises. Obviously, those high rises aren't market rate affordable, but it's a start. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, my contact information is here. I've sent Alan a copy of this. Um, and of course, the work that consulted if you want to do some additional reading on your own time. Otherwise, that is the end of my presentation. Well, thank you so much. That is a wealth of information, I must say. And uh, I'm interested in knowing if people have some questions uh, regarding- I see 44 answers in the chat, so. <laughs> yeah, they're quite a I will few. Try to, I will try to get as many of them as possible. Uh, maybe you could start with what is, what is an affordable housing covenant? Um, just affordable housing company is basically, you can basically think about it as a contract where like the unit will remain available to lower tier earners for a certain amount of time. So going back to U Street and Columbia Heights, we see the, these, these covenants that they were just for 30 years from their, their inception in the mid 2010s. So again, like you, you, in all the practical terms, you have these units that are privately owned but are reserved for affordable, again, reserved for lower tier earners for the foreseeable future. One of the problems that I think exists both in Arlington and here in Montgomery County when they talk about upzoning is there is a massive confusion between goals and the means to reach those goals. Mm -hmm. Most of us agree on the goals. We want affordable housing. We want greater equity. We want uh, a livable community for mm -hmm. as many people as possible. However, the question is, how do you get there? And what has been happening is that the solutions, you have given us a wealth of data on why most of these solutions are not going to mm -hmm. uh, result in what the proponents say they will. Um, are there any any measures that you're familiar with that have been used in areas throughout the country that have approached, you know, doing accomplishing what new urbanist mm -hmm. new urbanist goals uh, are trying to achieve? Sadly, none that I'm aware of. And again, what's happening in Arlington and Mont Montgomery County and DC is indicative both across the nation and the Western world as a whole. Um, we saw in the 1970s and 1980s, we retreated from this idea of significant federal intervention in housing policy. Um, I think the places I would look to for inspiration are Scandinavian countries like Finland, Sweden, Norway, and to a lesser extent, Germany. Like they spend a lot more of their budget on both direct construction of affordable housing, as well as tax credit vouchers, like similar to Section 8, but a lot more robust and a lot, a lot larger in scale. 
And I think, again, if you do that in tandem with new urbanism, you might see a lot more movement in terms of affordability. Mm -hmm. But again, adapting these more like in these, in these Central European models to the United States in terms of like legal and political implementation, I'm not sure how viable that is, but I'm hope hopefully we can figure something out. Right, and but in these countries, there's much more government investment in the general yes. well-being of society than there is here. I noticed in the comments after your article, many of the people were saying what they say here, who are for these measures. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's better to do something than to do nothing, and I personally think that is a very questionable assertion. Um, but I want to, you know, refer to a, a couple more questions uh, regarding your talk. Uh, Brenda Freeman, please. Are you muted? My question, um, Brenda? Can you hear me? No. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> we can hear you. Good. <laughs> one of the things I've noticed. Barely. Since this model continues to be used, but it is not working, what could be the motive behind this? So I'm beginning to think the idea is to achieve the opposite of what they're talking about, and that is to displace people under the pretext of finding them houses or finding them homes, because it, it's, it goes on and on. And that, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, ordinarily, if something doesn't work repeatedly, People yeah. doing it. So. I, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think, it, I think it perpetuates for two reasons. One, it's simple to understand, simple to implement. It costs, it doesn't really cost the, the county government that much. And also, I think you're right in that the county that allows governments to wait out the clock without having to make difficult decisions on resource and budget allocations. So would otherwise be incredibly politically contentious. So again, like if you if you delay the process long enough and people are gentrified out of Montgomery County or Arlington or DC, it then becomes Frederick County's problem or Prince George's County's problem or Prince William County's problem in Virginia. And I think that's I think that sort of exists in the back of the minds of a lot of people in positions of power, unfortunately. Yes. Um, Karen Cordry? Yeah, I've been participating in this and on a county uh, advisory committee like two years ago or so. And I, basically, I came up with the idea, field of dreams. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, the, the idea is, if we pass it, they will build it. And mm -hmm. what I think I hear you saying is, if we just pass something that says you can do whatever you want, we won't get what we want. So do you see a model where there is a viable economic model for the government to say, you can do this, but you have to do it? You know, if you, t if you take a $700,000 house, you're gonna have to at least build three $600,000 units on it and, and have controls on them and things like that. But that's the only way you're gonna be able to, to do this because, you know, I, I think what I hear everybody saying is that if we just hope they'll do what we want, they won't. Yeah, and this is kind of the laissez-faire attitude that led to things like Enron, Bear Stearns, more recently Norfolk Southern, Theranos. Like, if you just get out of the way, the market will somehow give us everything we want and need. And that's not necessarily true when the profit margins aren't there. I think at the local, at the county level, at the local level, they don't have the resources or the gravitas to make this happen. Again, I think state and federal interventions are what is needed. I think you might look at the idea of passing a McMunition in Montgomery County to build an affordable, a quality affordable housing complex in Prince George's or in another part of Montgomery County. Um, again, I would, this is like what's known as Peruvian welfare economics, but I, you know, I think like something along the lines of that at the state and federal level is what's needed to realign market incentives. Of the county, county governments, city governments, they just don't have the political will. They don't have the ability to implement this the way it needs to be done. Only a larger scale political entity government can do that. 
But again, whether or not there's a will in Annapolis or in the halls of Congress is another story entirely. Right. Any other questions? Well, this has been. Uh, well, I've got a question, Liz. Yes. And, uh, yes. Michael, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we're going to study your PowerPoint and thank you for the resources and uh, offering yourself up as uh, somebody we can consult going going uh going oh, forward yeah. i'm wondering we saw that well, at least we read this week that uh the arlington county board adopted what was described as the most ex extreme um uh, measure or proposal for uh for upzoning in arlington county they uh, would call it the most flexible but yeah and uh, so one of my questions was, was that a, a comprehensive zoning plan for the whole county or was it for um, separate different areas? That's the first thing. And the second. It's, sorry, well, go, sorry was, go ahead. I was going to ask what the uh, the. What kind of proposals did uh, you call them opponents of uh, missing middle housing? I'd like to call them something else, but the people who are looking for alternative alternative approaches did uh yeah. they prepare a sort of counter proposal of ways to uh attain affordable housing in Arlington that was uh, vastly different than the one that the county board eventually adopted so to answer your first question it's more or less countywide i think there are certain there are certain areas such as now in Sherlington, which have been historically African American, which I, I believe are exempted under this current proposal. But again, a lot of these missing middle types are already allowed there. In terms of practicality, it will affect everything but the wealthiest parts of North Arlington where there are no metro and bus lines. So again, they they have adopted this. I, I, there are several options like that they will vote on. There's options like 2A through 2E, and we're not sure what, what they will adopt until Saturday, but I, all indications are it's going to be option 2A because that was what was recommended by the Planning Commission. Um, but again, like for all practical terms, purposes, like this being just about all of Arlington is fair game for upzoning. And again, except for the wealthiest parts in the, next to McLean. And then the other groups that that were opposed, uh, did they have a, 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 a platform? Yeah. So I know that they've just released their county proposal. I haven't had time to read it yet. But again, I know like a lot of these, I know a lot of the people who are leading these groups. And like me, they are proponents of what is now smart growth rather than, the, again, the laissez-faire zoning deregulation. Um, there's no one definition of what smart growth means. And again, since I haven't read their proposals, I can't comment on them, but I will forward you the information and, the, and everyone can obviously uh, access it that way. And then one of the things that you noted in, in your article in the Washington Post was that the desperate need for more, more data did uh, mm -hmm. the planning commission and the board make any estimates about what they thought would be an increase in quote unquote affordable housing if they uh, the position that they adopted uh, uh, was implemented? They again they made it they made an estimate on price. They made no estimate on the number of units that were created. Um, a lot of people are saying that it will be negligible. Um, again, this again to me it just wasn't a serious analysis. Arlington County, as a government agency, has access to a lot of restricted census micro data that even I don't have, and they just did not utilize that, and that's incredibly frustrating. Liz, yes, uh, there as well as here, there is enormous political opposition to this, to this kind mm -hmm. of measure, because they are betting on, as you said, the private sector to solve a problem that really 
government should have been able to deal with for many, many years mm -hmm. and failed to do so. Um, what do you think is their political calculus that they are alienating so many residents, so many voters, and think that that's not going to have an impact on them? So far here it is not, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. most people have no idea what mm -hmm. the county is doing. Well, again, Arlington, like Montgomery County, is a political monopoly. And as someone who got, and I hate to say that because I used to volunteer with the Arlington County Democratic Party a lot. I got my start as a field organizer for Barack Obama. It gives me no joy to call out Arlington <laughs> County Democrats in this way, but I think, again, I think you're just going to wait out the clock in hopes that this issue will become settled very quickly and people will move on to the next battle and forget about the one that's being fought now. Right, and as you pointed out, this will have an enormous impact on property taxes. Yes. If the property values go up, which is, is the whole goal, this is a major revenue mm -hmm. source. And this is really probably one of the major reasons that these measures are being passed. They don't know mm -hmm. what to do, so they're thinking, well, if we put three or four or eight units on one lot, we're gonna get a lot more revenue and that's gonna solve the problem. However, yeah. As Karen pointed out, they're saying, they're thinking that, oh, well, we'll do the housing first and then we'll do the economic development, whereas it should be vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. And one other thing I forgot to mention is that in a place like Arlington, where there's a political monopoly, a lot of these people are making the calculus that I only need to get like eight to 15,000 votes out of a county of 236,000 people. Once I get past the primary, I'm untouchable. And I think, and again, this is, again, the problem with political monopoly, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or Libertarian, or whoever that's in charge. Again, you only have to appeal to a 51% constituency in a very low turnout primary election. That's all that matters to you. You're right. And if, again, like, building coalition with developers and Enthusiasts will get you to that 50 plus one number. That's all you care about. I think you're right. <laughs> Any other questions? Now, let me ask a question, Michael. Did uh, during this conversation, this debate about missing middle housing in Arlington County, mm -hmm. did any of the uh, board members talk about the need to get more state aid, more federal aid that was uh, directed? for housing is that a is that a priority for them because obviously the market the market based situation is not going to get you uh housing that's affordable for people in those lower ami categories wondering if uh, they talked about public resources well the frustrating thing is like i, I think well i think you need to answer the preference that question is like before 2021 and after 2021, because there was a power shift in Virginia in 2021 in the state house where Glenn Youngkin became governor and Republicans took over the lower house. But even before that, you saw a new effort to bring state aid to Northern Virginia and Arlington specifically. And this, despite the fact that four out of the five Democratic leaders in both chambers were from Northern Virginia, and again, you had you had this random window of opportunity where the House, the Senate, and the governorship were all held by Democrats, all from Northern Virginia. Yet there was no push to bring the state into this, despite the fact that, again, this has been a problem bubbling up for 20 years. So, again, that, it's just a frustrating missed opportunity. And of course, now the idea that a Republican House Speaker from Shenandoah cares about Price, real estate prices in, in Nova is just ridiculous. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Liz? Yes, uh, any other question? This has been absolutely fascinating and mm -hmm. we will be referring to your references <laughs> and your, your observations, but mm -hmm. uh, what we think is so helpful about this is that it's helpful to have a factual reference point, which has mm -hmm. been quite, talk about missing. <laughs> This, yes. In our discussions here in Montgomery County, and those of us who have studied this very carefully are incredibly frustrated that the facts don't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. And that is, the facts are still there, and they are stubborn facts, and they are the reality, mm -hmm. but we're not dealing with, with reality. We're dealing with 
in many ways, magical thinking. Uh, if, you know, as, as Karen says, if you build it, they will come well, no. Uh, and, and also, mm -hmm. and our plan, it's sort of like been cast in amber. They passed what was mm -hmm. developed three or four years ago and before the pandemic and all the factors about the transit system, mm -hmm. about, uh, about new work patterns, yeah. and housing have not been factored into the plan. Yeah, we have a similar situation in Arlington. So, uh, again, the county made major bets on Amazon bringing a certain amount of jobs and, I guess, like cyclical or business clusters and retail, uh, of course, cyclical retail and spending activity that just hasn't materialized. Um, we have the same office vacancy rate that we do we did before Amazon came, which is 20% or we do now. Um, region wide, uh, using key swipe data from Castle Systems, only only about a 46, 47 percent occupancy rate in the region right now. And again, if half the people aren't in the office, that's like that's like a lot of property tax. That's like a lot of retail and happy hour spending. A lot of these governments were counting on to tax the finance or operations. And I think there's just this head head in the ground mentality that somehow things will magically go back to 2018 and 2019. But like we're again we're three years into COVID, we're three years into work from, from home. There's a new normal here whether we like it or not. And this needs to be factored into both municipal finance and municipal public policy, whether we like it or not. And again, I think there's that's I think you're gonna have a lot of government push that back as much as possible because again, they don't want to make a lot of hard decisions that they've avoided so far. Right, right. Uh, Karen, Karen, up? Karen? Yeah, the only thing I was gonna say is it, it, it seems to me that we're not gonna get anywhere unless we do start trying to figure out something, some way, somewhere <laughs> that, we, that we actually make progress on these issues there. It, you know, it, it, it's fine to say, and I think it's probably all true, that most of these plans aren't going to work out the way they want them to. But to get away from the whole, oh, you're just being NIMBY kind of approach, it seems to me mm -hmm. we have to start really concentrating our efforts on trying to figure out what will work. Is it the take everything, yeah. one story building and build, you know, um, six stories of, of uh, uh, decent sized housing on top of it? Is it get the, the government more involved in, in mm -hmm. Saying you can upgrade, but only if you you know you can upzone, but only if you really do uh, put you know three relatively affordable mm -hmm. units in place. I mean, it, I, I I see us saying a lot of no. I haven't seen a whole lot of how we get to yes yet, and that's what I hope you and everybody else would start. Yeah, out <laughs> uh, trust me, you have, have, you're a lot of smart people, not just me working on that. But again, like going back to Cabrini Green in Chicago or. Some of these other things like doing something isn't always better than doing nothing, especially if that something costs you 10% of your affordable housing stock. Yeah, I, I don't want to just do something, I want mm -hmm. to do the right thing, but we, yeah. we got to find we got to figure mm -hmm. out a right thing somehow because we really do need to deal something with this. Before we call on uh, Carrie Lamari, uh, Michael, in this these conversations about missing middle housing in Arlington County, did anybody ever suggest that? Um, this plan should be piloted in certain parts of uh, the county. So, what is going to happen next is that they are going to, I mean, they're, they're only going to issue a certain amount of missing mail permits for the first few years. Um, that's probably going to sunset after three. So, like, again, you'll have this trickle. And I mean, somewhere in between 40 and 100. So, like, you'll see this, you'll see this trickle at first. And then, we may or may not have good data after that, uh, but like what again? Once that is sunsetted, it's open season everywhere all the time. Um, but again, hopefully we will know more about it before that sunset provision takes place. And Carrie Lamari, yes, yeah, uh, and this actually goes to to what uh, Karen said. Uh, you speak up. Okay, this actually goes. I uh, could you hear me? Yeah. No. Okay. This actually goes to what Karen said. Um, the problem has been the same from the beginning, whether whether it was in Minnesota, Minneapolis, or or in uh, Seattle or anywhere else. Uh, people want 
other people to come up with a proposal that's going to work. But, but the reality is we don't have a voice in government. No matter what we suggest, it goes in one ear and out the other. They've got their own proposal. So we don't have that opportunity to, to, to massage it and make it work. I mean, I've been talking about you know, with community land trust and how you could actually create affordable housing from the beginning. You think anybody listens? No, nah, no. Nah. They say, okay, we can have community land trust, but then you make it, then you make it by right. So it doesn't work. You see, the, the reality is the politics, it's a funny tool. I mean, there, there are funny tools in politics. The use of the word NIMBY. If I can diminish your value, by, by slandering you, saying, oh, you're a NIMBY, and you, you just want to stay the same. No, that's not the truth. But they, why should we, we try to uh, defend ourselves? It, it's going to happen. You know, no, no. I mean, this is just politics as usual. You've got a group of people that have an agenda, have a proposal. They're, they're, they're pushing it forward. And uh, to those naysayers, you know, who, who might have a proposal, but don't have a voice, they don't care. In the let end- Let me try to steer this. Let me try to steer this in a different direction. Okay, you do uh, Michael, did the issue of community land trust ever come up in, in Arlington County discussions of missing middle housing? Not uh, in the serious way that I'm aware of. Um, you, you saw a couple, of, you, you saw it come up a couple of times, but it wasn't really talked about in any of the consultant proposals or the county analysis you didn't really hear it mentioned in board in board discussions um again it's, it, it's just frustrating it's just like how much of a wasted opportunity this is and that's that's exactly what i'm talking about you know they they're not looking at creating affordable housing they don't care about affordable housing you know for, from their perspective this is a democratic agenda that's promoted and they're going to there's going to be there is going to be some funding to some jurisdictions that that that, that promote it and uh, in the, and there's going to be opportunities for developers and if there's opportunities for developers there's co uh, campaign contributions down the line mm -hmm. the public what about this? the what public about this, Michael? Just does not have a voice what about this something? michael did uh, are there churches over in arlington county that have been talking about uh, facilitating affordable housing on some of their properties. We have some over here. Um, so in terms of congregations in Arlington, the Episcopal Church, which I'm a member of, and the, and the Catholic Church are the two biggest sort of players in that regard. Um, my parish owns several properties that we went out to deserve in families. Um, it's just... Again, this is a question of whether or not you can do that at the scale needed, and that has been a, a vexing problem. Is that I have, I have to interrupt to the scale that you need to meet demand is never going to work, in my opinion. Uh, I have to interrupt. Uh, that's where I, I at least like not the Harry, the reality, please a short comment. The reality is, you can take one lot. And if you upzone that property and create four units and you and want to utilize uh, uh, um, uh, the, the affordable housing scheme that we're talking about, you can sell one at market rate and then you've got three units that have free land. So it can be done. You can take one property, create four units, sell one of them at market rate, and then you'll have free rent for the community land trust to share on the, the, the other three properties. You no, can a, create a mechanism that does that. No, we should have well, there's question. been some research that suggests that people won't pay market rate if they know that the other units in that building are going to affordable housing. Like this is something again, that Derek Hire, my old professor American, documented in Southeast DC. And again in, in U Street. Like what are we like? I mean, you get like People won't pay premium rates to live next to poor people. It's it's just an unfortunate fact of human psychology in America. Yeah, but we can also massage plans. 
and 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 to sell to make it require them to buy two houses and one one house could be market rate mm -hmm. all of it and the other one could be all community land trust there's ways to do it yes yeah. in arlington county where lots are very scarce and again, you have a lot of out of state investment firms scooping up properties within an hour of they come on the market. It's like, how do you put two houses together to, to execute such a plan? Well, Just to follow up on that point, um, Michael, did, was there any conversation about limiting the uh, participation about national real estate investors in the missing? Mm -hmm. Arlington County hasn't done an analysis of this, even though they have the data to do it, even though the Washington, Washington Post reported on this like right after HQ2 came out, like with all of their data collection cap capabilities, no analysis was ever done. And again, it goes back to the question of do they want to know the answer, knowing what they would have to do if they knew the answer. And did they um, ever do they ever do a racial impact study? They, um, I mean, they did an equity study. But again, I just didn't think the methods were that rigorous. And again, their conclusion was vastly different than mine. So as a reminder, my conclusion was only about 9 to 11% of African-American and Hispanics could afford new missing middle housing. I, they gave their response, their analysis, I, they, that, that it, minority home ownership could increase to a threefold, but they didn't really use a data set or a statistical technique to justify that. They're very interested so in that because we, as our county true. council, our county council commissioned a racial um, equity study and uh, they never really listened to its conclusions. Even when the people who were, who mm -hmm. were conducting it said, we need another year to really get to the, get to the meat of what the, what the issue is. And so. Yeah, because like a lot of that would, like, you can use like secondary, quote unquote, secondary quantitative data from the Census Bureau or Federal Reserve. But that will only tell you so much. You need a lot of people trained in case study research to go into these communities, talk one, go block by block, search by church, meeting, taking notes, etc. That is very time and resource consuming. Again, like what. What are you going to do when you have results? Will these political timetables wait two, three, four years for actual robust data collection to take its course? I mean, it was the sad, unfortunate truth of public policy in America is that a lot of these decisions are made on political timetables rather than technical or scientific timetables. I mean, for example, no, you don't, have to, you don't have to give us an example. Okay. We saw that firsthand in Montgomery County last fall as there was a race to uh, pass the general plan uh, when the consultants said they needed another year to do the analysis. So uh, okay. we, get, we yeah. get the trade off between the political calendar and the technical need assessment. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Liz, do you want to conclude? I, I just wanted to add you, you mentioned to us in emails that it's very difficult to study gentrification and displacement because there's so much time between when the economic impact starts to take an effect mm -hmm. and people make the decision to leave because they can't afford to stay anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of thing that you know needs to be studied. Uh, and of course, they're not willing to do pilots as, as, as uh, Ellen pointed out. They're not willing to establish benchmarks. They're not willing to do even what a public relations strategic plan would do, which is okay, you've got a couple of months or a couple of years, uh, you set up your benchmarks and you, you change your tactics if it's not working. But nothing like that has been considered. It's just sweeping measures to uh, affect, a five, in our case, a 502 square mile area. Uh, which is going to have, you know, it's it's going to have unforeseen effects, and they're working from a model that simply is not relevant to reality. But and particularly with these racial issues, the the logist, the, the the rationale for these changes is that it's going to promote racial equity and uh, affordability, and all of the facts suggest that they will do neither. You want to conclude, Liz? 
Yes, I just want to thank you so much, both of you, for your for your insights, for your research, for for giving us your time and and your thoughts. And we we appreciate more than we could possibly express uh, the information you've given us. And we will attempt to make use of it <laughs> in the months going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll talk. We'll talk, we'll talk to you soon, Michael. All right. Sounds good. I look forward to it. And again, if anyone has any follow up questions. Um, just shoot me an email. Like again, I'll send my finalized presentation slides out, and you can contact me that way. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, let's uh, let's complete our meeting. Let's see what we got here. I'm going to remove uh, your spotlight. Here we go. Uh, that was a very interesting conversation. I hope people learned something. Uh, Chris Reynolds, I want to talk to you about some of those issues that you raised because I like your perspective, um, and we we need to we need to hear more about that. So let's talk about that uh, about that sure. later. Um, so we're going to conclude our meeting in uh, in eight minutes. And by uh, hi Evelyn, and. Uh, <laughs> in uh, at by 10 o'clock um you know we usually we usually review our uh the information and uh notices from our uh, from our our committee structure um just want to mention to you i didn't mention at the outset that uh and one of the things that's coming up in the month of march is the uh, pedestrian is the public hearing on the pedestrian master plan and i know that uh eli glazer who's been working so hard and he spoke to us about it last fall um is hoping that there's a lot of public participation in the in the hearing about about the pedestrian safety plan so uh you know please uh we'll try to send out a note with a link and uh, you can send writ written testimony or uh i think you can test um testify I think you can testify live, but also over the uh, over the internet. Um, Jerry Garson, you're raising your hand. Yeah, I'd like to give a brief transportation report. I'm going to I'm going to speak on behalf of the Civic Federation on the issues that we raised on the pedestrian safety preliminary master plan. Uh, the new uh, report is about four times the size. I also like to mention that the uh, uh, P3 proposal uh, for rebuilding. Uh, uh, 495 and parts of 270 has basically collapsed. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, for those of you who are still on the call and put questions in the chat, I'm sorry we didn't get to uh, all of them. I know, I know that some of you raised your hand and some of you put questions in the chat and uh, it was sort of a, a wild, uh, wild dialogue that we had with our two subject matter experts um, anybody want to say anything about education? I'm just going to mention what I mentioned last week and last month, which is um, I'm still really concerned about this uh, this rise in anti-Semitism that we see in MCPS. Um, doesn't seem like anybody's got a handle on it. Um, they talk about discipline for some of the kids, but it seems to be increasing and not diminishing it. And that's just very problem problematic for me. So I just uh, I wish somebody at the Board of Education in the police department try to get a handle on it. Uh, anybody want to offer anything on the environment? Well, then we'll skip to uh, we'll skip land use and planning because this was about land use and planning. Um, Peggy, do you want to talk about legislation and what we've done? Am I on? You are. Okay. Um, I've just gotten back from Florida and I haven't had a chance to catch up with the offices of the legislators whose bills we are supporting to find out what their status is. I will say, I do think we should continue to support Don Ludke's Transparency Act. Uh, we've already discussed that. It's the uh, Open Meetings Act, which mirrors to some extent what's being done at the state level, but this would be done at the county level. It's Bill 8 dash 23. Well, I agree 100 percent. That's all. Um, thank you. Anybody about about legislation? Um, 
public safety. I heard, well, those... talk, I heard a talk by the police chief this morning. It was quite interesting. He is uh, definitely against uh, the Juando Mink bill. This was the police chief. Uh, Liz is talking about the D18 breakfast meeting at Tasty Diner yes, with, the, with, the, with the Montgomery County police chief. Go ahead. He was very interesting. And he said he's opposed to, to the, uh, the bill by Will Juando and Kristen Mink to prevent traffic stops for what they consider uh, not terribly important, I, for, for want of a better term, uh, offenses. But these include uh, having an expired tag uh, and all sorts of other uh, concerns. That and he's he's worried that uh, if they're prohibited from these kinds of stops, they will be prohibited from a probable cause for a number of of, of serious offenses. He is, however, um, somewhat favorable to the public safety approach that the council has come out with about re instead of uh, requiring that businesses close at a certain time, re setting up a, a process by which businesses must make a commitment to uh, promote security around their businesses and be held responsible for it. He thinks that's worth trying. So that was rather interesting. But it was, he was saying that, you know, we're not in much, we're, sh we're not compared to other counties and jurisdictions in the area, we are. In, still in good shape, but the serious crimes that have taken place are, are just that, and they're working very hard on them. That's that was that was a, a, a productive talk. One of the things that we've got a lot of that Civic Fed has got a lot of comments on are the the road diets, the uh, the uh, bikeway uh, infrastructure proposals that are uh, popping up at the county council. Old Georgetown Road, Tuckerman Lane, um, other places, uh, Little Falls Parkway. Um, part of it is a conversation about what some of the neighbors and the civics uh, consider as sort of a, la a lack of engagement with um, Montgomery County Parks as they go through these plans. So uh, we may we may bring that up as a topic for our our April meeting. Um, because uh, there's a lot of there's a lawsuit now. I believe that uh, Kenwood right. is uh, is is suing the county to uh, stop the project to uh, limit Little Falls Parkway to two lanes and take the other two lanes in either direction and turning it into a long horizontal park. So there's lots of uh, concern about uh, about that. Um, I think maybe in our April meeting we'll review the. The county executive's budget, which I believe is going to be released, Jerry, what, the day after tomorrow on the 15th of March? I think so. So we'll be we'll be talking about that. Um, in our newsletter, some of you might have noticed that uh, I uh, submitted a letter to the county executive asking for his support for funding the Office of the People's Council. And uh, hopefully that's going to be in there. And then if it is, then our effort is going to be, you know, contacting council members and trying to get majority support. We're not asking for a lot of money. I mean, it was one, um, one FTE and an administrative person. Um, last year was less than two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in a budget of what six billion dollars, five billion dollars. So it wasn't much, but there is some pushback from members of the county council. Anybody else, Peggy Dennis? Uh, yes. Is there any reason why the website could not be expanded to have, instead of just the, the topic legislation committee, a topic for legislation where I could post information about both county bills, hearings, et cetera, public meetings, and state legislation, uh, keep them up to date in a timely manner so that people can reference that if they're interested? Why don't we speak privately, Peggy? Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that at the executive committee meeting. And uh, Harriet has, has reminded me that the uh, Little Falls Parkway project proposal is not a county project, but a um, parks department. So an MNC PPC project. So thank you for that, Harriet. Glad to have you here. Anybody else have anything they'd like to uh, share? 
then it's 10.01. If not, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second? Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> those opposed? <laughs> See you guys. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>